Welcome back to Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. You can follow us on Facebook at Igniting a Nation, Twitter at Igniting a Nation, and our, on our YouTube channel, Igniting a Nation. We're delighted to have you with us this morning as we're talking about spiritual blockage. We're talking about the blockage of the spirit and the things that keep us from receiving all that God has. Early in my walk with the Lord, I was given an entire collection of Watchman Nee's books. They became a foundation stone in my understanding of body, soul, and spirit. I want to share with you uh, an excerpt from The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. I thank God for the many teachers who have sown into my life and the many authors who have contributed their works to my ever-growing desire to walk closer with the Lord. One of the things I have found is that from an original thought standpoint, <clears throat> many of us have ideas and thoughts, but there are those who have made an impact on the world. And rather than invent some new approach or try to think ourselves so spiritual that we draw upon our own words, I find a great deal of comfort in standing on a foundation stone that taught me so much. Let me share with you from his book, The Spiritual Man, a segment on the blockage of the spirit. The spirit requires the soul and the body to be the organs for its expression. The spirit is like the lady of the house. The steward and servant must carry out the lady's wishes. The spirit is also like electricity and there must be a filament before it can express its light. If the soul and body are attached by the evil spirits and become a abnormal, the spirit will be blocked and have no outlets. The enemy knows the importance of the spirit. He often works in a believer's soul and body, causing them to lose their functions so that the spirit no longer has an organ for its expression. By this, the spirit loses its victorious position. At such times, the mind may come under attack and become confused. The emotion may feel lonely and sad and we may feel tired and lifeless, unable to direct the person, ourselves. The body may feel very weak or somewhat lazy. If the believer's soul and body are attacked and if they do not oppose it right away, their spirits will be blocked. They will not be able to fight vigorously with the enemy and maintain their victorious ground. Once a believer's spirit is blocked, he loses his vigor. He will appear shy or withdrawn and he will not want to do anything in public. He will prefer to retreat to the rear of the battle line and will not want to expose himself. He may think that this is an enlightenment for him, but actually this is a blockage of the spirit. When he reads the Bible, he does not seem to have much energy. When he prays, he does not seem to have any words to say. When he considers his spiritual work and experience, they seem meaningless and even at times silly. When he preaches, he does not sense any result and feels that he is only going through the motions. If this condition persists, the believer will come under further attack and find himself choked and muffled. This will continue unless God intervenes through other men or through his own prayer. If a believer does not have the proper knowledge, he will become very bewildered. Usually he does not try to search for the reason for this blockage, but instead allows it to go on. Strictly speaking, every spiritual experience and feeling has a cause to it. We should study it carefully and not allow it to remain in us indefinitely. Such an experience happens when there is a blockage of the spirit. The soul and body outside the spirit have been locked up and the spirit has no chance to express itself. Satan has imprisoned the spirit and locked it up in a dark room so that the soul no longer has the leading of the spirit. Once the thing that blocks the spirit is removed, the believer will find the outlets cleared and he will recover his former lightness. It's very important for a believer at such times to exercise his will to speak aloud. 
He should speak words of rebuke against the enemy, and he should speak out with a loud voice the victory of the cross and the defeat of the enemy. He should single-mindedly oppose the enemy's work in his soul and body. This will must stand behind a person's words and actively reject all blockages. Prayer is another way. Prayer is often the way to remove the blockages, but at these times one has to pray out loud. The, guest, the best kind of prayer at such time is to call on the victorious name of the Lord Yeshua, Jesus our Messiah, and withstand all the attacks of the enemy. One should also exercise his spirit and channel its strength to break open a way to come out. A believer's spirit can become poisoned by evil spirits. This is what the fiery darts of the enemy do. He can shoot his darts directly into a believer's spirit. He can shoot sorrow, sadness, suffering, grief, and heartbreak into a believer's spirit, causing him to have a sorrowful spirit. For Samuel 1.15 says, But a wounded spirit who can bear? And in Proverbs 18.14, Hence, this greatly affects a person when a believer feels sorrowful. He thinks he is feeling sorrowful, considering this sorrow to be very natural. He does not try to find out its cause, nor does he try to oppose it at all. He accepts everything that comes to him silently and without any objection. We have to remember that this is very dangerous. We can never accept a thought carelessly or allow any feeling to come into us. If we want to walk according to the Spirit, we have to be watchful in everything. We must study all our thoughts and feelings and find out where they come from. Sometimes Satan causes our spirits to become hard, stubborn, narrow, selfish, wild, and disobedient. Consequently, the Spirit is not able to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and carry out God's will. We will lose all of our love for men and all of our gentleness, sympathy, and considerations for the weakness of others. When this happens, the Holy Spirit cannot use us to any great extent, and we will have lost the Lord's broadness and set up a boundary for ourselves. Sometimes the enemy puts an unforgiving spirit into believers. This is the most frequent poison that believers take in. This probably accounts for the majority of cause of failures in spiritual believers. This kind of poison, such as fastidiousness and vengeance, is the most deadly poison to the spiritual life. Even after a believer has suffered from this poison, most of the time he will still not be clear about what happened or realize that this poison came from Satan, the accuser of the brethren. Instead, he thinks that he hates others and that this cannot be removed. Sometimes Satan causes believers to become narrow. He will cause believers to set a boundary for themselves and separate themselves from others. If believers do not have the concept of the church being the body of Messiah, instead making their own little group their foremost concern, it's a sign that their spirit has dwindled and become narrow. A spiritual believer considers God's business as his own business and the whole church as the object of his love. If his spirit is open, the river of life will flow from everywhere. But if he becomes narrow, he will frustrate God's work and minimize his own usefulness. If our spirit is not big enough to include all of God's children, it means that our spirit has become poisoned. Sometimes Satan causes the believer's spirit to become proud. In this way, they become boastful, self-respecting, and self-esteeming. Satan causes the believers to think that they are not destitute, that they are somewhat important, and that they have some worth in God's work. This kind of spirit is also a great cause for the believer's failures. As we read from Proverbs 16 and 8, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The evil spirits inject such things together with other poisons into the believer's spirit. If the believers do not oppose these things immediately, they will quickly turn into the things of the flesh. It becomes know-how to live in the spirit. If, if believers know how to live in the spirit, these things will only be Satan's poison at the beginning. They will not have an opportunity to become a sin of the flesh. However, if do believers do not oppose them, subconsciously accepting them instead, they will soon turn into sins of the flesh. If the spirit is poisoned and the poison is not quickly dealt with, it will turn into sins in the spirit. Sins in the spirit are more serious than other sins. 
Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But turning, he rebuked them and said, you do not know of what kind of spirit you are, from Luke 9, 54 and 55. The kind of spirit we have is important. Many times our spirit is stirred up by Satan and we do not know it. Once the spirit errs, everything else errs. When we consider the experience of the two disciples, we can see that a wrong spirit is very easily detected in our words. However, the words probably do not reveal as much as one's tone of voice. Many times the words may be right, but the tone is wrong. If we want to overcome, we have to take care of the tone in our speaking. Once evil spirits touch our spirit, our tone will lose its gentleness. All harsh voices, rash voices, and sharp voices do not come from the Holy Spirit. Rather, they are signs that the ones with these voices have already been stirred up by Satan's poisonings. How do we ordinarily speak? When we speak about others, can we speak without any sense of condemnation? Perhaps what we say is true, but a spirit of criticism, condemnation, wrath, and jealousy may be lurking behind truthful words. We should speak the truth in love. If our spirit is pure and meek, we can speak the truth. But if a spirit of condemnation is lurking behind our words, we are committing a sin. Sin is not only an act, but also a condition. The spirit behind all our actions is very important. Many times we, we can be working for God or man and committing sins at the very same time. The work may be done, but a spirit of dishonesty, unwillingness, or grudge is hidden behind it. We should maintain our spirit in a sweet and tender condition. Our spirit should be clean and pure. Do we consider a wrong spirit a sin? When does the atta enemy attack our spirit? When, when is our spirit poisoned? If we know about sins, will we remove them humbly? When we detect a hardening of our tone, we should immediately stop and not go on. We should immediately say to others, I would rather say the same words with a clean spirit. I would rather oppose the enemy. If we are not willing to tell our brothers that we are wrong, our spirit retains its sins. Believers should learn to guard their spirit from the provocation of the enemy and to guard their spirit in sweetness and gentleness. Ordinarily, a believer should have the shield of faith for the quenching of the flaming darts of the evil one. This means that he should exercise a living faith to oppose the attacks of the enemy and should trust in God's protection. Faith is our shield. It is not our extracting pliers. It is for quenching the fiery darts, not for pulling them out. If believers are hit by the darts, they should immediately remove the cause of the firing darts and take up an opposing stand. They should immediately reject everything from the enemy and pray for God's cleansing. Welcome back to Revealing the Truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. You're watching our program, which covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We encourage you to follow us at, on Facebook at Igniting a Nation, on Twitter at Igniting a Nation, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Igniting a Nation. We're talking today about blockages, spiritual blockages, the symptoms and the causes. There are reasons for the most common forms of blockages. And as elementary as this may sound, many deliverances are unsuccessful because the person was not ready or willing to be truly delivered. They were merely looking for a quick fix for their problem, but were not willing to take the necessary steps to receive and maintain their deliverance. As Watchman Nee wrote, this is something that you must resist from the start. It is not a matter of pulling the fiery darts out of yourself after you've been shot, but creating an environment where you are always on the ready. That you are taking inventory. You become spiritually self-aware. You become socially self-aware. You become biblically self-aware. You measure your condition based on you being able to hear your own voice, to 
see your responses to circumstances. If there is a compounding of circumstances in your life, you must address all of them in order to prepare yourself to be ready for a complete deliverance to remove all of the blockages. Just like our drains and our sinks, it is not the first item to go down, but it is an item that goes down that begins the process of blockage. And as it begins to mount and add up, had we noticed what went down the drain, had we begin to realize that maybe something too large was placed in that drain, we could have taken the necessary steps to clear the blockage or to prevent the blockage. This is our responsibility as believers, to constantly check ourselves to the Word of God, to use the indwelling, the infilling of the Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, and alarm us, alert us, so that we are truly willing and we are truly ready. I can tell you that unforgiveness is the most absolutely and diabolical sign of blockage. It is a poison to the soul. It is a impedance to every part of our walk with God. Clearly in the word it says, if you cannot forgive your brothers, I cannot forgive you. Bitterness is a popular source of spiritual defilement. Hebrews 12, 14. If you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. Matthew 6, 15. Unforgiveness puts us in the hands of the tormentors. Matthew 18, 22 to 35 which are nothing more than demonic spirits. God instructs us not to allow a bitter root to grow up in our hearts as it will choke our hearts. If you have a pet, if you have a dog, you actually give them heartworm prevention medication because you understand the process of, of this insidious ailment for dogs where something wraps itself around the heart, it infects the heart, it chokes off the very life of the heart. The heart is the largest muscle in the body. It pumps our blood, it keeps us alive. But if we allow a bitter root to grow up into our heart, unforgiveness, it chokes the very life off of us. Our hearts cannot beat to their fullest. And therefore we begin to cut off the lifeblood to our bodies and to our spiritual health. I'm often reminded that people who cannot forgive have forgotten what they have been forgiven of. The Word of God says, none are righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, we have to remind ourselves that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. When we look at our lives, I look back at my 44 years, I look, I look back on my 65 years of life. And I understand that in those 65 years of life that I have continued to make mistakes, that I've sinned, that I have done things, said things that I should not do. And I have asked forgiveness from those that I felt that I have offended and needed to make things right with. But I've also released all those who have betrayed me or slandered me or lied about me or bore false witness or put me in a position where I was under constant attack and there were betrayals. Because I hear those words of Messiah on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Your spirit can be blocked because of strongholds. Strongholds are incorrect thinking patterns in our mind that we see things through. Many people see themselves as failures, so they feel like failures. 
Others see God as a cruel and dictating taskmaster, which causes them to feel distant and unloved by their Heavenly Father. If you have a hard time feeling God's love, you can cast out all the demons in the world, but if you don't see God as a loving God who loves you, it's going to be very difficult to feel and receive His love. That's a blockage. It's a wall between you and the Lord that you cannot feel, you cannot receive. It's like standing in the sun wanting to feel the warmth of the sun on your face but wearing a mask. Knowing full well that the mask is there and you cannot feel the rays of the sun hitting your face. You cannot feel the warmth of its glow on your face but you do nothing to remove this mask. That is a stronghold. You must recognize it, remove it so that you can walk in the fullness and the glory of God. Our prayer life, our walk can be blocked our spirits can be blocked if we have unconfessed sin first john 1 19 says if we confess and repent of our sins god is faithful and just to forgive us but if we choose rather to keep our sins hidden and to ourselves we cannot expect god's forgiveness there is also power in confessing our faults to one another as james 5 16 tells us confess your faults one to another and pray for one another you may be healed the effectual, righteous prayer, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. Something many of our audience are not familiar with is a soul tie. Having a soul tie with somebody means your soul is joined with theirs. This is quite common in failed marriages or for people that have physical relations with somebody it says for this reason a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife or you cleave to someone who is not your wife and there is a soulish connection there can be a soulish connection to the dead as we know King David had a soulish connection to his son when he died and he cried out before God in such anguish that the men who were under his command heard him and they took that message as to believe that he would prefer that his son live, but all of them would perish. We are connected to our past, and unless we do what we're called to do, which is not to look over our shoulder to cut it, but to reach behind us spiritually and cut that tie. We may be joined to another person with an unclean soul tie, that can allow a transference of spirits and bondage between the persons. It's vital to break all bad soul ties from unhealthy past relationships so that the enemy cannot use them against us because that keeps us connected to our past. It is a bungee cord. You think that you've moved away from it, but you reach a point and it pulls you back. You cannot break away from it unless you cut that soul tie. And there are soul ties with people in your past. There are people who have soul ties with their children, soul ties with their parents, soul, soul ties with their former lovers, soul ties with their former spouses, soul ties in a way that is completely and totally unhealthy. And it is like a straw where their spiritual maladies flow clearly through a pipeline to you and yours back to them. It is an unhealthy, past relationship and it must be cut. The way to cut it is to forgive us, forgiveness, to release it. The way to cut it is to reach behind you, knowing that you cannot move forward until you are released from this past. You know, the Bible gives us clear patterns of destroying false gods, idols, and cursed objects. God warns us that bringing a cursed object into our home can bring a curse upon us as well. Deuteronomy 7.26. Most people think that that's something that's done away with, but I can assure you that just as Paul laid his hands on a cloth and people believed that that cloth carried the spirit, the anointing, and those prayer cloths went all over the world, people still do this. I have done it myself when I could not be there. I have sent an anointed cloth that I prayed over to someone who was in the hospital. That objects can carry with it. As you look through your homes and you find that there are Masonic, that there are things of the past, that there are idols of the past, there are things that carry with it. If God did not believe that an object could be cursed, 
and you could bring that into your home, he would have not have given us that warning in Deuteronomy 7.26. That was not done away with with the shed blood of Jesus. Curses attach themselves to things and to places. In this studio, when we moved into this studio, we anointed every wall, every corner, every piece of equipment, every part of the building, every door, every portal, every entranceway. Because we don't know who the former tenant was. We don't know what was here before. And certain objects from the former tenant, like bookcases and some various equipment, was left behind. And so we had to anoint it and cleanse it. Now, is this something that is super spiritual or superstitious? Certainly not. It is clearly biblical that things attach themselves to things. Another source of blockage is lack of faith, not understanding or believing God's will or the truth about your situation can keep you in bondage as well. If you don't realize and receive the authority and freedom you have in Messiah, it can be very hard to walk and eat of its fruit. Knowledge of the truth is indeed an important tool in our spiritual toolkit. You do not realize that in your life you've made vows and oaths that bind the soul. Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2. The way to break free from any godly vows is to repent of it and renounce it verbally in Jesus, Yeshua's name. We have sworn an oath to companies, to people, to situations, to clubs and organizations, and we must review those oaths because they do bind the soul. There are unbroken curses, both ancestral and curses encountered in one's life may, must be broken. There are people who have spoken curses over you that you may not be aware of. I believe ancestral sin curses are automatically broken so that long as we have accepted Messiah and do not take part in our ancestors' wickedness, but other types of curses must be broken before complete deliverance can be obtained and kept. There are people who have spoken life or death into you. And you must bind every curse, whether it's spoken or unspoken, in order to release yourself from it. And then there are such a thing as residing spirits. Demons often need to be cast out of a person before they're able to fully overcome their many persistent bondages. Demons are often found behind many issues such as fear, depression, physical infirmities, arthritis, cancer, deafness, mental illness, and need to be driven out as Yeshua and the early church went about doing. We as believers cannot be, in my opinion, demon-possessed, but we can be demon-oppressed. And if you matter at all to the kingdom by doing God's work, if there's fruit in your life for the kingdom, then the enemy will come against you because you matter to him because he does not want you to move forward in effectiveness for the kingdom. If you are not having any troubles in your life and you are a believer, it must be because you're not bearing fruit for the kingdom. And we must remember that every branch that does not bear fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire. God wants us to bear fruit for the kingdom. But that also means stepping up to the front lines, knowing that attacks will come and Jesus promised that there would be tribulation. There would be troubles. There is blockage in our lives for us to receiving all the blessings of God. I want to encourage you to examine yourselves, to understand that if you are being blocked, that these are just some of the many reasons as you perfect, like all of us, the walking out of your salvation with fear and trembling. We'll be right back. <laughs> 